Hi everyone, thanks for joining uh, this edition of Ask a Biller. Today we're going to be talking about what out-of-network providers should know about billing. Um, the one thing I want to note just before we get started here is that this whole uh, program is not about simple practice. So we're not talking about how any of this works in simple practice. This is purely about the insurance aspect of it. So moving on here. So my name is Avery. So I've been working at Simple Practice for the last three years. Um, I'm an insurance specialist there, so I work with a lot of providers in regard to their uh, insurance and what they're doing with that. So it's I'm really just glad to be here um, taking part in this and just being able to kind of contribute to the insurance knowledge that's out there just because I understand it can be a rather confusing topic and a very important one. So the more people who understand that, I think you know, everybody is just better off. And then as you're all familiar with uh, Barbara Griswold, our insurance guru here, uh, you know, she's <laughs> She's a, a practice consultant and the author of Navigating the Insurance Maze, uh, you know, in its eighth edition. So check that out. I'm sure that'll be extremely helpful, too, in addition to all of these Ask a Biller uh, videos. She's been, um, you know, in private practice for 30 years, and her goal is to help therapists feel as confident about their business as they do about their therapy. So, you know, she invites you to contact her at her website, theinsurancemaze.com, for questions and everything else. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and just start answering questions. Actually, we'll get to this first. I apologize for about this slide. Um, so basically, you know, I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with this um, with this series. But if you ever want to go back and watch all of the previous um, videos, you can go to simplepractice.com/askabiller series. You can go ahead and type that in, and it'll come up. You just have to enter your email in. Once you do that, all these little locks on these videos below will go ahead and disappear and you'll have access to watch all of them. It's a lot of good information and it should help you out if you're just getting started or if you just have questions about you know, particular topics here, you see that are the headings of these videos. So, so now we're gonna go ahead and start with some of the questions that uh, we received earlier or that we have you know, set. So the first one is, what is an out of network provider by, from Janice D? Well, great. First of all, uh, this is, again, Barbara Griswold, and I just want to say to everyone, thanks for being here. And um, I love doing these things with simple practice, and um, it's nice to be invited. So thanks for carving time out of your day. So let's start with the basics. What is an out-of-network provider? Um, basically, people are, are like, how do I become a, an out-of-network provider? What does it mean? An out-of-network provider is just anyone who hasn't signed a contract with a particular insurance plan. So if CureQuick Insurance Plan has signed a contract with many people and I haven't signed a contract with them to become a preferred provider with them, I'm automatically an out-of-network provider. So it just means basically anyone who hasn't signed a contract with that particular insurance plan to, to provide services for their members. All right, I'll move on to the next question here. So how do I become an out-of-network provider? Do I need to register somehow? Jeff. <laughs> so uh, basically, people are always saying that, how, yeah, is there some place I need to register? How, what do I have to do to get to become this out of network provider? My answer is usually just breathe. You are automatically an out of network provider if you have not signed that contract, as we talked about. So probably everyone out there is out of network for some insurance plan. <laughs> so we're all, everyone who's operating out there are out of network providers. Um, even if you've signed up with a lot of plans. You don't need to register for almost, I think TRICARE may be the only one that asks people to register in some manner to be an out-of-network provider with them. But for the most part, uh, you are just automatically out of network with any place you did not sign a contract with. Uh, in some occasions, aren't isn't there a document you also have to submit to? Maybe for, it's just for TRICARE, you have to submit that document to be registered that way. Is that right? Um, yeah, TRICARE is the only one that I've heard of that you actually, they want you to kind of sign up and register, but we'll talk later about W-9 forms and that, that might be something that you might be referring to. This next question here, do all clients with health insurance have some coverage for out-of-network therapists? From Thomas. So this is a great question. Oh, all these are great questions. So I created a little slide for this. So if you can advance to that, I hear your little click. Did you advance? Oh, yeah. Are you? 
Okay, <laughs> since I can't see it. Um, so we've got, there's some clients of yours will have out of network coverage and some will not. And the way that it's kind of broken down and we're not gonna go into great detail here is that if your client has an HMO, which is a health maintenance organization or an EPO, uh, exclusive provider organization, these only cover network providers. So if your client comes to you and they said, oh, I have Anthem Blue Cross and you are not a network provider for, network, excuse me, they say they have Anthem Blue Cross HMO and you are not a network provider for Anthem Blue Cross, what that's gonna tell you is they're not gonna cover you. So HMO, EPO is a, is a red flag for you that if you're not a member of their network, you're not gonna be covered as an out of network cover provider. Now, if your client has a PPO plan, which is a preferred provider organization, or a POS plan, which is kind of less common, which is a point of service plan, these plans cover both network providers and out of network providers. So we'll talk about how you can use that later, um, I think. Uh, and so in these plans, the client just usually pays more when they go out of network, but they do have some coverage when they see any out of network um, provider. So this means they can see anybody, they just get incentives if they see somebody in network. So the next question here is, how does insurance billing work for out of network providers from Marin P? Yeah, another great. <laughs> so we'll go to the next slide on that one. So <clears throat> how it usually works is the client's going to pay you in full at the time of the session, ideally. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm very big stickler on that one. Big piece of advice uh, is, you know, we work in a very volatile profession. People get mad at us. It's really important for us to, to pay, get payment in full at the time of the session. That's my big stickler piece of advice. Um, or yeah, some people do bill their clients periodically, let's say at the end of the month for all their, you know, whatever their fees are, and then they pay you. But the bottom line is that out of network, your client should be paying you in full. And then if they do have out of network coverage, which again, not everyone has, you can give them a statement or a super bill. Uh, it's called many different things, an invoice, statement, super bill, uh, reflecting that they did pay you for those services. Now they turn around, they take that super bill, they send it to their insurance plan, and they try to get reimbursement if they have out of network coverage again. And ideally, the client is at least partially reimbursed. So that's ideally how it works. Next question is, uh, as an out-of-network therapist, is it possible to bill insurance directly for the client, collect from insurance, then bill clients the remainder from Mary C? Yeah, so it's possible, and I have done this in the past. Um, so basically what we're, they're saying is, is it possible like not to collect from the client at the session? Uh, say to them, look, I'm out of network. I don't need to do this for you, but I'll, I'll bill your insurance. They pay, they'll pay me and whatever insurance doesn't pay me, then I'll, I'll bill you client. Um, it, it's risky. Let's put it that way. Um, sometimes what happens, and, and I've done this successfully with some clients, a client had 50% out of network coverage. I build the insurance plan. They paid me 50%. I just had the client pay her 50% every time she came in. Um, it's really risky though, because what sometimes happens is that the insurance cuts a check to the client instead of you, because usually they're used to that with out-of-network uh, therapists is that they just cut the check to the clients because the client usually is paying the therapist. But in this case, you're doing something different. So sometimes they're gonna pay the client and then you're rushing after the client saying, hey, you owe me money and then the client may not pay you. And so I've heard a lot of poor stories or bad stories where the therapist did this but didn't get paid in full for the sessions. Um, so I think that this is risky and I don't advise it. Next question. One of my therapist friends who is also out of network offers courtesy billing. How does that work from Meredith S? So this is less risky. Basically, this means if you're trying to make it easier for your clients to get reimbursement, you know, I totally get this. We have depressed clients, we have anxious clients, we have clients that aren't really that good about billing their insurance and we're worried that they're going to not be able to continue to afford 
some therapists offer courtesy billing, which means basically, yes, you still need to pay me up front. I, I'm, I've gotten paid. I don't have to worry about not being paid by the insurance plan. That's kind of what's going on in your head. But I will submit the bill on your behalf to your insurance plan. So it's basically, as a courtesy to you, I will just submit the bills on your behalf and then the insurance plan will will pay you as they you know should have if you submitted it yourself so you're just kind of doing the administrative billing on their behalf uh, but you've already been paid it's not you're not taking any financial risk here now obviously this takes a little bit more work on your part or your staff part but sometimes it'll attract a new client if you put that on your website that hey, we offer courtesy billing to your insurance plan or something like that. So some people will do that to assist their clients or to attract potential new ones. And then how often should I give clients super bills? What should be on my super bill? Asks Jennifer ah. C. And I'll move on here so <laughs> we can see the next part. Well, the first question is how often should I give clients super bills? And what I'm gonna tell people is, is you know, tell your clients, to submit their super bills as, as quickly as possible. So I would at least do it monthly and, and encourage your clients to submit them. <clears throat> Sometimes you give a client a super bill and they sit on it for a year or two and then they submit them and they realize they're not gonna get reimbursed for any of it because there's some problem. So I would encourage people, you know, submit them early if, if they're counting on the reimbursement so they can find out if there's any issue that we need to clarify or uh, they don't want to go past the time filing date. Usually people have a year or so to submit out of network, um, but I've been hearing that they're getting tighter about that. So different insurance plans might say it needs to be submitted within three months for you for you to be paid, uh, reimbursed. So that's I would just tell people, hey, here's a super bill, but submit it as soon as possible. Now, what should be on my super bill? I went back and forth how to do this, but I thought, Instead of giving you a whole list, I'm going to show you two things. I'm going to show you just like a little cutaway from a super bill. And then I'm going to tell you a place where you can get a sample super bill. Yay. I decided to give that as a freebie for you guys today since you tuned in. Okay. So here's a sample cutaway of a, ther of a super bill. You want it to have your name, obviously, your contact information, phone fax, the date of the invoice, and then client name, date of birth, definitely diagnosis codes. Don't put the name of the diagnosis, just the codes. You're, you're restricted to putting the minimal amount of information on any information that you give out to the public. You don't wanna put more information and you don't really want them saying, what, borderline personality disorder, what's that? You know, you, know, <laughs> you just use codes. Um, and if there, you have multiple diagnosis codes, then put them down. Um, now you'll see that for each line that you have there, you're gonna have a different date. I only put one line here. So if you have multiple dates, you should have a separate line for each one. So here at 424, place of service code, I just wanna review these quickly. Place of service code is a telehealth session 02. You're going to have to adjust that. If it's their office, it's going to be 11. If you don't know the place of service codes, just Google them and just say place of service code and look at the um, government list. But many people don't have this column on their um, super bills because we were used to doing everything in office. Add this column I would recommend and also add the modifier column now that we're doing telehealth sometimes. Uh, so place of service code needs to be kind of highlighted because it tells the insurance plans that this is a telehealth session. Um, CBT code should be whatever uh, CBT code, we don't have a lot of time to go into that today, but hopefully you know those codes. If not, contact me. <clears throat> modifier 95 is the most common com modifier for a telehealth session. If it's an in-person session, you can leave this blank. There are other modifiers, but that's the one we mostly need to know. And then if you have a service description, it's good to, to put video if it was a video session or telehealth or telemedicine. Your charge, what you collected, and then a summary to show that somebody paid some money here, and that's why you're giving them this super bill. You should sign it, you should have your license number on there, and you should have your, I, here I have, uh, Thelma Therapist has her EIN, which is one form of tax ID, 
or your social security number. So that's either your employer ID number, if you have that, or your social security number should be on there, uh, and your NPI. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. You're gonna get a sample copy if uh, you write in for that, so we'll get to that in a minute too. Did we advance? Tell me what you advance. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm, over here, I'm over here blind. Uh, so other thoughts about super bills, uh, just make sure you include your license number. Sometimes people leave that off. Uh, for telehealth, some people are like, what if you have an office address uh, and you were at home, you still use your office address, even if, you're, if you were at home. Uh, so don't try your best not to put your home address on your super bills. Uh, obviously, you don't really want your home address uh, out there uh, that you're giving out to clients. Um, and then if you want to read about, if you've given up your home address, uh, I have some articles online uh, on my articles page at theinsurancemaze.com backslash articles. If maybe uh, Nick or Avery, you can type that in the text in the chat. Uh, and if you've given up your office and you want to know, you know how to deal with that. but uh, list each date of service on separate lines we mentioned. And if you're a group, be sure that you give the rendering provider's name and their NPI as well as your group name and your group tax ID and the group NPI. So the only tax ID that should go on this would be the groups. Don't put the, the individual provider's tax ID, but you're going to make it, don't make it seem like someone else provided the service. You have to put down who provided the service and their NPI, and then the group's tax ID and name and NPI. Now, what if a client just wants a receipt, not to submit to insurance, but they just like want it for tax purposes or some other reason? Just be sure not to put down all the stuff on there that's like no diagnosis codes, you don't need CPT codes, um, basically make it a lot more the most important thing to leave off is diagnosis, but make it a lot more just a business receipt where paid for, you know, psychotherapeutic services or something like that. Make it kind of more general. Moved on to the next slide. Okay, so here's where I want to give you for free for showing up today, uh, and I'll say it again later. But this is where I'm going to give you a sample super bill if you go to this website the, where it's highlighted in yellow there theinsurancemaze.com backslash O-O-N. You just give me your email address and instantaneous, uh, no, it, it will yeah pop up immediately, but don't do it now because you're watching this. <laughs> but uh, and then it will pop up with the links to a sample super bill, which you can adjust and make, you know, customize for your service uh, and a check and coverage handout, which basically what you should ask insurance if you're going to help your client uh, check their coverage for your out-of-network services or in-network. Or you can go there just to join my mailing list if you're not there so you can hear about other terrific services I have, resources I have, and webinars I'm doing. All right, so back to questions here. We have this one. What do I do if the health plan reimburses me instead of the client from Karen? Yeah, this is a tricky one. Sometimes, again, you've given, done everything right. You give the client a super bill and they submit it to the health plan and somehow the health plan writes you a check. <laughs> it, health plans are very confused. Um, it's, it's tricky because it, the easiest thing to do obviously is to sign it over to the client in some way, but it's possible that later the health plan could say, oops, we paid you by accident, pay us money back and you've already paid the money to the client and it gets sticky. So the best thing you can do, and it's sometimes really hard to do, is uh, have the client contact the insurance plan and you know, alert them that they paid the wrong person and have them either put a stop payment or ask the health plan how to handle this. But you know, don't, you know, I've done it before, but I probably don't recommend that you sign it over to the client or that you cash it. It's probably best to just tell the client they need to look into it and get make sure they're they're paid appropriately. And yeah, we'll leave it there. So next question, my client's insurance plan is saying they need a W-9 form from me before they can reimburse her. Should I submit this or do I get this from Teresa Yu? Uh, 
This is a very common question. It seems like, oh, you're out of network. Why are they asking for a W-9 form? What is a W-9 form and, and should I do this? And the answer is yes, this is something that you should do. But the way I think of it is basically the insurance plan is getting a, a is getting a bill basically for your services and they don't have you in their computer. You're not a provider that they know about. So the W-9 form, and so they're getting a bill that has a tax ID number that they're not familiar with, an NPI they're not familiar with. Basically, a W-9 form attests, you've signed it and you've said, yes, I am a healthcare provider. I That, that W-9, excuse me, that uh, tax ID number is mine. I'm signing this here, put me in your computer officially. So you can just down, go Google W-9 form on, um, on the internet and just look for the IRS site and you can just print it out or fill it out online and then print it out and sign it and then give it to your client to submit um, or whatever way they want you to submit it. So it's very easy to get, it's free and you definitely should do this or else they may not pay her um, claim or her invoice. Next question here. Can you be audited or have your records requested if you're out of network and your clients get reimbursed? Can your treatment be reviewed? Um, Janica V. Okay, so <clears throat> this will be a big surprise to some of you. A lot of you have decided not to participate with insurance because you do not want your uh, records requested. You don't want your treatment reviewed. This is the last thing you wanted and, and that was part of your decision not to get involved with insurance. But guess what guys, while it's not as common, <clears throat> your records can definitely be requested and your treatment can definitely be reviewed. And if you think about it, it's as soon as the client basically you know, submits a super bill, they're saying to the insurance plan, hey, I want you to pay for my my in treatment and that gives the the uh, insurance plan the right to review what kind of treatment are you getting i mean are you are they paying for uh therapeutic drumming and maybe that's something they don't want or aromatherapy and that's something they don't want to cover so they definitely retain the right to review treatment before they're going to pay for it and the same thing with your notes um a couple of Co colleagues that I know have gotten um, their records requested and they're out of the network before the the claim even gets paid or the invoice gets paid. So, um, and even sometimes after it's been paid. So this can happen. So what I tell people, <clears throat> a lot of people who tell me, well, I don't have to keep good notes because I don't work with insurance plans or that's a, that's a fallacy. That's very, you know, you, I always tell people, you should have the same quality of notes, uh, whether you work with insurance, whether you don't work with insurance, uh, whether you have some insurance clients or non-insurance clients, all your, the quality of notes should be high, no matter what the payment source is, uh, because they can always be, you know, audited. And also, even if you don't have any clients who are submitting to insurance, you know, a complaint could be filed against you uh, or, disability or other reasons. So, you know, I'm a big advocate to having really good notes. You know, I just wanted to jump in one thing just because I've gotten questions before and I spoke to you about this, Barbara. Um, when you file a claim, you're not actually required to submit your note along with the claim, right? Um, well, that's something right. only want to do if they- you should not. Yeah, you should not do that unless requested by the plan, right? Cool. So the next question, are are there documentation requirements since we're not contracted in Jenna L? Yeah, it's a great question. It's surprising, but um, they are going to look, I, I have seen situations, for example, with particularly United Behavioral Health, uh, and sometimes we don't ask where our clients are um, submitting our statements or our super bills. And I think we should start asking for a couple of reasons I'll, I'll talk later, but United Behavioral Health recently particularly has been <clears throat> requesting notes and sometimes of out of network providers. Um, and that's Optum, that's the same company is known as Optum or United Healthcare. And they are looking at out of network providers and they're still saying, you know, we wanna see that you have 
the same quality of documentation. Um, now, one of the things, for example, one therapist, uh, her client did not get reimbursed because she had not listed interventions in each one of her notes. Um, so she has to prove basically that she provided a medical service and what was the medical service that provided that she provided. And because she hadn't written that down in each note exactly, she took notes about what the client said and what their symptoms were, they wouldn't pay for those sessions. So it, when you say are there documentation requirements, well, kind of uh, in that, and they may vary by insurance plans and you may not know them because you're out of network. So it's unfair, I, I grant you. But I think there is a standard that we all need to be, be doing in terms of, we should always be writing down our interventions or what we do in sessions. So those are some things, hoops that we all need to, to, to jump through. And these can hurt our clients if we're not keeping good documentation. So like in that example I gave. So if your progress notes suck, I've got a whole <laughs> webinar on that, how to write great progress notes and what do insurance plans want to see in documentation so that you feel confident and your clients don't risk, you don't risk them not getting reimbursed too. I lose a lot of new clients when they find out I'm not on their health plan network. Any suggestions of how I can deal with this from Pamela S? Yeah. So, you know, when a client calls you up and says, uh, you know, do you take, are you on my network? Very often, obviously, the answer is going to be no. And then they hang up and, um, or, or they, they email you, same thing. So another thing that you can do, and when I was building my practice, this is what I did. I would say, hey, you know, why don't you let me call your insurance plan and I'd be happy to look into your coverage uh, to see me. And, you know, they give me the information over the phone about their um, um, coverage, uh, about their, um, from off their card. I'd call their insurance plan and I'd get their out of network coverage and I'd call them back and I'd say, here, here's your, you know, I'm sorry to say I'm not on your insurance network. However, you do have, let's say, out of network coverage and it's pretty good. They cover, you know, 60%. And, um, so you can kind of give them an idea and you, maybe you've used up your deductible for the year. So um, this is what it would be. Now, very often at that point, they say, well, geez, I'd rather only pay my $10 copayment, which I, if I was seeing somebody on the network, I would only have a $10 copayment or something. And you could say, yeah, I totally get that. I would do the same if I were you. I totally understand. And they say, oh, well, I'm going to go try to find someone on the network. But you know, the reality out there is that it's very hard to find someone on the network these days sometimes because people who do take insurance, their therapists who do take insurance are often very full. You know, I feel like most insurance plans I work with don't have enough therapists on, on their panels. Clients are waiting. Clients are not being able to find someone who's appropriate for them to see. So what often happens in those situations is like two weeks later, I'd get a call back and they'd say, you know, I have been unable to find someone on my network. You were so nice to call my insurance and I just had a good connection with you. Um, I, I need to see somebody, can you get me in? So I think sometimes, you know, yes, it's a lot of trouble to call somebody's insurance plan, but it can really pay off. And if right now you have the desire to um, fill your practice uh, with more people, you have some empty slots in your practice, it can be worth that investment of time. Next question, what are the most common reasons an out-of-network claim might not be paid in full or might be rejected? From Micah, and then moving on to the next part here. Yeah, so here's a couple just common reasons why um, you, a claim, or a, I keep calling a claim, uh, but a super bill might be turned down by the insurance plan. So late filing, we talked about before, if, if someone's sat on those claims and never turned them in, um, and it, it's gone past their, their limit of when they will process a claim. Went to the deductible is like the most common. Um, provider fee is more than the plan's uh, allowed amount or UCR. I'll talk about this in a minute. So client gets a lower reimbursement. So one thing you have to be careful of is if you look into the insurance or if they look into the insurance and they say, well, I have 60% coverage. Let's make it 50. I have 50% coverage. So it, your fees, you know, 150, that means I'll get 75 bucks back. 
So you have to be careful. Uh, clients don't always get uh, the, 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 the insurance plan might say, oh, 150, we think that's too much for someone, in, a provider in your area. So they may say, we're going to cut it at 100, let's say, I'm just making it even, and we're only going to give the client $50 back. So it's, it's just, it's important to tell the clients and for you to know that just because they have X percentage uh, out of network coverage, they may cap it. They may, they may have a cap and your fee may be higher than that. So th they may not get their full reimbursement back. Also, I wanna say this about the deductible. A lot of your clients will have a separate out of network deductible. So if your client comes to you and say, oh, I already used up their deductible, they may have used up their in network deductible, but they haven't used up their out of network deductible. And they may not, they may have very large out of network deductibles. Like, I think I have like a $2,000 out of network deductible or something on my plan. So, you know, it can take them a long time to, to use that up before the, and a deductible just means that's how many dollars they have to pay out of their pocket before the health plan starts paying. All right, uh, diagnosis out of date. I just wanna throw that in there. A lot of providers, if you're out of network, you don't always keep up with the changes in diagnosis. Um, so I totally uh, encourage you to um, follow my newsletter because I try to tell you about changes in diagnosis codes and also to utilize um, if you can type this into chat, guys, um, icd10data.com. That's a website that um, you can use to check to see if the diagnosis codes you're using are uh, up to date. Did someone type that into the chat? I think Nick is Hello. probably on it now. Nick, are you there? Typing it in right okay. now. Okay, icd10data.com. Okay, uh, yeah, just missing diagnosis code, CBT code, a big one now, the telehealth modifier, that can get a, it denied, place of service code. Provider tax ID unknown to the health plan, that's when they usually need to come back and get that W-9. May want to see your notes before they're paying, and again, this is particularly happening with that UBH, UHC, and Optum uh, conglomerate, which is one big company. Um, and they're especially doing this if you are billing for the 90837 CPT code, and that's the individual therapy 60 minutes um, code. They don't like that code. I would never use that code, even if I did a 60 minute session with those folks, because you're gonna set yourself up for a treatment review. They consider that code only for uh, extended sessions where it's a complex case, or you're doing EMDR, or you're doing trauma-informed treatment, like desensitization. So they only want, they don't really want that for routine therapy. So even if you do 60 minutes, I would encourage you to down code to a 90834 um, for your, so that's why it's important to ask clients, where are you submitting this super bill? So, um, so that you can down code it so you don't invite a treatment review. And then the final one, client not covered at the time of service or for that service. So that's another reason why, you know, the client might not have paid their premium. The client may actually have, gone to, a, you know, a lot of clients come to us and they're like, oh, I have Blue Shield and they actually have Blue Cross. They don't know the difference or I have Cigna. Well, you know, maybe it changed mid-year and they didn't know. So it's really important for them, again, to submit their super bills as often as possible and make sure that they're covered so that you can get this all, they can get reimbursed. Next question, what tips do you have for billing where insurance is not involved? That is for private pay clients from Lindsay K. Um, bill early and often, uh, get paid upfront uh, as much as possible. I mean, I think, uh, I think there's several ways that we leave money on the table. One, we don't enforce our uh, no-show policies. Uh, um, we don't see ourselves as a business. And, you know, again, I don't, I never do billing for out of network clients. I mean, I don't, meaning that I don't give a bill at the end of the month. If an out of network client is coming in to see me physically, 
they're handing me a check or they're handing me cash. I mean, I'm just like, I, I'm very, and if they're, if I'm seeing them by telehealth, then I'm charging them their credit card at the end of the session. So I, at the end of the day, make sure that I am paid by, <laughs> Uh, and I think we really need to, we don't like to think of ourselves that way, but, you know, as soft and as clinical as I want to be all day long, I try to be very serious about my business and making sure that I am paid uh, for the services I'm providing. So I don't really have tips for billing, except don't do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, the same thing, have a missed session policy so that, it, you know, if somebody does miss a session, again, by the end of the day, I'm, I'm charging their credit card for the missed session. So yeah, I don't, I don't know what other tips perhaps. Mm -hmm. How can I increase my visibility as an out of network clinician for Mary? Ooh, big topic. We could probably spend hours on that one. I think this is asking about marketing. Is that what you think? What do you guys yeah, think? it's like, a, you know, you have, um, what were those programs? Kind of like psychology today kind of thing where you can kind of uh, yeah. see same thing, but for out of network providers. I think I think uh, that the we can't underestimate, we can't overestimate the importance of a good website. A lot of us out there are kind of older, um, and we're not too good with the tech. And even some younger people are just not thinking that websites are that important. Um, websites are super important, even if you are on insurance plans, because it's just, uh, even if I go to the uh, Cigna website and I type in, if I'm the client I'm looking for someone on the network and I there's sort of like 50 names come up, I'm going to go down one by one and I'm going to look at their websites for more information. And if basically you don't have a great website, I'm going to skip over you and go to the next one because why would I, it's like having a blind date. <laughs> why would I choose you when I could uh, have a lot of information about these other people and see their nice pictures and see what kind of services they provide. So I cannot say more about how important a good website is and don't show it to other clinicians, show it to people who are not clinicians because we tend to be very oriented. Um, you have to think about, as, as a your ideal client looking at it, what's gonna make them choose you? And if we get overly like where we went to school and what kind of, that we're Gestaltian or that we, you know, we tend to talk about our experience and our training in a way that clients don't care. Client, not every client, some clients do care, but many clients are really trying to get from your website, whether you're going to get them, how it feels to be in the room with you. And you need to speak in a very, uh, casual format on your website. You need to be, um, you seem very accessible. You have to choose your pictures wisely. So I think just getting help with your website and your, your words um, on there is super important. So, that, and then obviously just uh, networking, it's still important getting out there and getting known by other people. And that's hard to do these days. But that's a whole other webinar we could probably do about increasing visibility. But thanks for the question, Mary. How do you recommend setting fees and operating solely as an out-of-network provider who sees self-pay patients from Tina M? <laughs> this is another one we could spend a whole hour <laughs> or two on. Uh, so I did create this little slide uh, for fee setting, just search Go to something like Psychology Today, uh, which is another one place that I list. I, I have my own website, and then I list on psychologytoday.com, which has is a great way to um, get um, get clients. I think uh, so. I would go online right now, and in my area, I would search listings of therapists in my area, and it, it lists, you know, what are they charging? So it's a good way. Uh, I did put a couple. Uh, links here that Simple Practice has basically, it's a little old, a 2018, but it's a therapy rates by state and city. And you can get a general idea of what people charge um, or were charging in 2018. Uh, and then I also put on here the Simple Practice Income Calculator um, to determine session rates that will cover your expenses. 
I think something that we don't think about, and we probably most of us have never done, is sat down and just wrote, wrote down basically how many clients do we have each week or do we want to have each week? Um, how many days a week do we want to be working? What expenses do we have? And basically, how much money do I need? Figure out how much money do I need to make in a given week um, to cover my expenses, and then go backwards from there and say, well, then how many people do I need to see, and how much do I need to charge for that? And figuring in a couple cancellations or sick that you can't collect for. I mean, there's always some that you can't collect for. A person in an emergency room, maybe you don't collect for that. Um, um, so it's a good thing for all of us, even veterans like myself to, to do is to kind of run this and see. Um, so this, this is a, a, a sample way to do that. They've set up a nice income calculator that can help you with that. Are we required to provide out of network options to clients from Sarah E? So I'm not sure what Sarah means by that, because as we said before, clients either have the out of network option with their insurance plan or they don't have the ability to go out of network and be reimbursed by their insurance so it's really something that the insurance plan is either covering or not covering <clears throat> now what she may be saying is do i have to give a super bill to clients if i don't want to i've had some people say um i don't want to give clients a super bill because then the, their insurance plan could come to me and want to review my treatment or want to ask for documentation. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's what Sarah is asking, but um, I have heard that from some clinicians. And I guess the way I feel about that is that um, I don't feel like ethically that's something that we can or should withhold from our clients. I mean, I try to treat my clients the way I would want to be treated. And if, my, if I were the client and I had out of network reimbursement, um, I would want my therapist to try to help me get reimbursed. And you may be ethically mandated um, to do that. I know uh, in here in California for the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists, I believe it's in our ethical code that we need to help clients uh, with their third party providers. So um, I think that that falls under there. And I think it's a small favor to do for clients myself. It's not fun, but it's, you know, it's also that not that common that they're going to ask you, but it can happen. Can I bill out of network when I'm awaiting approval for certain insurance panels from Jacqueline S? So, no, basically, I mean, excuse me, yes. <laughs> um, so let's say you've applied to an insurance panel and they haven't approved you yet. You are automatically out of network until that basically the insurance plan says, okay, as effective March 1st, you are on the network. So yes, you can give clients super bills uh, up until the day that you are on an insurance plan and then you have to you know, give them the benefits of their insurance. Now, another thing I wanna bring up here that I just thought about, let's say somebody is paying out of pocket and you know, you know they have, well, maybe you don't even know, um, it turns out that that person has Blue Shield uh, and uh, you are joining the Blue Shield panel. As soon as you get on that panel, you're going to, even though they're paying out of pocket your full fee, as soon as you get on that Blue Shield panel, you're going to have to offer them the benefits of membership, which is to come in and pay their little co-payment. And you're probably going to have to accept whatever the discounted rate that you, you know, negotiated or not negotiated, but you agreed to with Blue Shield. So one thing when you start joining panels, if you do, you have to pretty much ask everybody in your who's seeing you privately, are you on this panel because I'm joining it? And because when you sign an insurance panel contract, you're basically saying for all their members, you are agreeing to give them the benefits of um, network provider membership. So I hope that makes sense. So the bottom line for this question is yes, you can, uh, you need to bill out of network when you're waiting approval and conversely if you're getting off an insurance panel you still need to bill if you're giving them the 60 days notice or the 90 day notice when you're getting off an insurance panel during that time 
you are still on the insurance panel until your effective res resignation date uh, and then you can start billing out of network. I hope that all makes sense. I know there's a lot to take in. So are we now, at the next slide? We are, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, you know, your sample super bill. Um, just a reminder, uh, yeah, we're gonna take some questions, but I just wanted to give you this reminder that here's where to get the sample super bill. Make sure you're writing down theinsurancemaze.com backslash OON, which stands for out of network. I forgot to say that earlier. And your check-in coverage handout or join my mailing list. This is a, a great freebie. It's out of my sample forms practice I, uh, packet. I have a whole packet you can buy of 16 sample forms, but I'm giving you one for free if you just go to that website and get the link. Cool, so I'm gonna move on here now. Now we're gonna go ahead and just take some of the questions that have been asked. I have a few here in front of me. Um, so just to pick one. Are there specific risks associated with billing as an out-of-network provider rather than providing a client a super bill? I'm not sure I understand that one. Billing as an out-of-network. I think they're saying if you do courtesy billing maybe versus just handing a client a super bill, are there specific risks? What do you think? Uh, that's probably the way to interpret it. It might have just been, um, you know, maybe they, yeah, there was a little bit of confusion or something like that. Um, I, I'd imagine that's how I would take it. If you want to just talk about that a little bit, I'll move on to another one. Yeah. Um, so just to be clear, it giving a client a super bill uh, is is a form of billing uh, out of network or, or having the client bill out of network and uh, so you've got three choices. One is giving the client the super bill. That's a type of billing out of network. Another type is you billing directly to the insurance plan, which we mentioned, and uh, hopefully getting paid by the insurance plan and then billing the client for the remaining. Uh, but that's risky, as we said, as I said before, because you just, the insurance plan might not pay you they may pay the client because that's what they usually do with out of network situations. So that's a little risky. And then the third choice is the courtesy billing we talked about, which is you get paid, your financial butt is covered, but you're just saying, I'll take care of the administrative stuff, the paperwork, I'll submit it on the client's behalf. And that doesn't have any downsides to it. It's just, um, except for, yes, it's you have to check on the client's insurance and if it's changed, and in January each year, you have to check and make sure that you're kind of keeping on top of where to send it and any changes in their coverage, or at least, you know, making sure that you know what address to send it to. But for some people, therapists, that's very easy if they're already billing for other insurance clients, um, especially. So that one doesn't have as many, that's just downside, it's just time and, um, Obviously, the easiest thing is to hand a super bill to clients, but a lot of clients that they don't know what to do with it. Or, oh, there is one other thing I guess I should mention is there's a, also a an app called Reimbursify, hmm. and I don't know a lot about it. I, I just interviewed them, and I have a uh, article on my website, which is theinsurancemaze.com backslash Reimbursify, re r e i m b u r <laughs> F, I think, uh, anyway, reimbursify. Anyway, there's an app that the clients can, the same way you can take pictures of a, a check and submit it um, to your bank sometimes, um, you can take a picture of a, a super bill and submit it to your insurance plan. So um, you might have you or your clients look into this. This is a uh, there's ways to do this for free or very low fee um, if your clients are having trouble submitting them themselves or if you know they're very tech savvy. Cool, so let me go on to another one here. Do I need an NPI to bill out of network? Um, I would recommend everyone get an NPI. They are definitely useful and um, but at this do you need an NPI to bill out of network? Ooh, probably not, but I don't know what reason not to get one. So they're easy to get, they're free, and I wouldn't want them to be it to be kicked back 
for that little reason. So yeah, de definitely get it. Let me get this one. Where can I buy the eighth edition of your book, Barbara? I'm only seeing the seventh. <laughs> oh, well, at theinsurancemaze.com backslash store. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then are we allowed to collect payment from the client up front before submitting the claim and the insurance refunds them? You know if you want to read that one allowed, Are we allowed to collect payment from the client yeah, that's what we're right. That's what we're talking about. Is definitely that's the ideal way. Is that you should be submitting, you should be collecting the payment at each session, um, and you can give them a super bill, and the, the insurance reimburses them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did I miss something there, or does that did I? Uh, yeah, it was pretty straightforward. Yeah, they pay you, and then uh -huh. you do everything afterward. Um, mm -hmm. And then we got you mentioned a webinar based on how to write good progress notes. Where can we find that? <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're helping me sell myself. Theinsurancemaze.com backslash store. So all my courses, all my webinars, I've got ones on treatment plans, I've got ones on progress notes. Yeah, how to write a five minute treatment plan. Huh? Um, uh, how to write great progress notes. There's ones on um, couples therapy. There's ones on, um, overview of insurance and what you should everybody should understand all kinds of different courses and you know um, resources there the insurance maze.com backslash store <laughs> simpler than reversify <laughs> um anyway yeah so it's like those are most of the questions we got right there um barbara do you have any final thoughts you want to share with everybody um before we head out or or have you said everything you want to Guys, here's your opportunity. Type it into chat if you have any leftover questions. Well, I'm sure this has never happened to us in all the years we've been doing this. <laughs> Haven't had extra time. Usually we have too many extra questions. Um, what other things do we want to say about out of network? Um, hmm. Well, here's one. How do you, also, yeah, sorry. go ahead. How do you differenti differentiate to the insurance company to pay the client? you know, courtesy billing versus paying the provider, um, then in parentheses, billing and waiting to charge client. Um, yeah, um, you're gonna see on my sample super bill, if you get that, which I encourage you to, there's a little section that says, please pay client, therapist or other, and, and you'd be clicking that. Also, you would be reflecting that no amount of money was paid, um, so the total amount due would still, you know, so you're going to be reflecting on there how much money the client paid for the service. So if it's zero or if it's, they just paid a copayment of some sort to you, which, you know, probably. Um, so again, you're reflecting how much is paid, but as I said, insurance plans don't always look at that they closely and they just are used to whenever they see something like this super bill come in, they sometimes just cut the check automatically to the client. The other thing I did want to say is that, um, you know, when we talked about that, you can't always tell, um, well, we said that sometimes they cap the amount that they will pay for out-of-network providers. So if you charge $200, they may say, oh, we think that's too much for a provider in your area. We're going to only reimburse, we're going to only allow 150 and then we'll reimburse some portion of that. Um, it would be nice though, wouldn't it, if you could call into the plan or the client could and say, well, hey, my provider charges, what, what is the allowed amount for this service? But you will find if you call them and say, hey, what's the allowed amount? So I can tell my client what they're gonna be responsible for uh, or how much reimbursement they're gonna get back. Insurance plans won't tell you this amount. They guard it like Fort Knox, you know, they're just like, we <laughs> do not give out that number. Sometimes if you say my fee is $200, is that within your UCR or is that within your allowed amount? Like if you volunteer your number first, sometimes they'll say no, uh, you know, our allowed amount is 150. So if you're going to try to find out what that number is, ask them uh, that way. Um, what they aren't don't the reason they don't want to give it out is that basically if your actual fee is 150 and you call up and you say what's the allowed amount? And they say 200, they're afraid you're gonna dial it up and bill for 200, right? 
Oh, there's a couple other quick. Did you guys get any qu more questions? I have a couple other. Yeah, yeah, one right here. Um, okay. I recently called an insurance provider who asked, I complete a form for a single case agreement to get the out of network benefits author authorized. Is this common? So a single case agreement is different in that basically for that one, usually this is how it works. Sometimes it works a little differently, but usually how it works is that for that one client, you are agreeing to act as an in-network provider. So they pay you their co-payment, uh, you submit the claims on their behalf, not usually super bills, you're actually having to fill out a claim uh, form, which is different and then the insurance plan would pay you. And usually you've agreed on some discounted rate, but sometimes you can get your full fee with a single case agreement. And this usually happens only like when a provider, a client can't find a provider who's on their network, or they can't find somebody who has the availability they need or the specialty they need. So basically the insurance plan was forced to go out of network to, or they agreed because you were already seeing with the client and they, you know, we're being nice and saying, okay, we understand it's in the client's best interest to continue to see you. So yeah, these are possible to get. They can be very troublesome though, because sometimes, you know, you submit a claim and you show up as an out of network provider and they don't have you properly put in their computer. And so sometimes you have to, you have troubles getting paid. So it can be thorny. I've done a lot of them. Sometimes it works great. Sometimes not. I'll, I'll read off this last question just because we have a minute left. But if you can get to it, great. If not, you know, it's okay. But um, do you have to accept the out-of-network reimbursement rate, or can you balance um, bill if your rate is higher? There is no out-of-network reimbursement rate. Your uh, oh, balance bill if your rate is higher. In fact, when you're out of network, you have to whatever number you put on the claim for on the super bill. Let's say you put two hundred dollars down there. And the, I mean, you have to collect $200 for that session. Otherwise it's insurance fraud. So balance billing means, you know, whatever the client gets paid back or you get paid back, whoever gets paid back, you have to make sure you collect a whole 200 for that session because you told the insurance plan that that was the cost of that session. Um, which doesn't mean, I just wanna really throw this in because it's really important. Uh, you can have sliding scale fees. You can have every one of your clients can have different fees for the same CPT code. That's up to you as an out-of-network provider. So the insurance plan is not going to be suspicious of that. But if you've put $200 on them for this person, you can't say, never mind, you, I'll only collect X amount of dollars. No, you have to balance bill if you're the one collecting uh, for the insurance plan. Now, this doesn't usually become an issue because usually the client is the one built submitting the bill and getting paid or not. So this only affects you if you are doing that um, billing on behalf of the client. So I'm uh, sorry if we lost people during that, but hopefully other people stayed with us and know what we're talking about. Well, so I guess we're was, out of time, huh? That's all we have time for. Um, I just want to let everybody know too, you know, thanks for joining and that you're going to receive a recording from today in the follow-up email tomorrow. Um, so take a look at that if you you want to go back and review anything. Otherwise, everybody, thanks again for joining. And Barbara, thanks again for you know, taking all those questions. Thanks Probably. for having me. Always a delight. Awesome. Take care, everyone.